Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for February 16th, 2018. On today's show, we're going to be diving into a bunch of news, including audience numbers for the Cloverfield Paradox, the possibility of Paramount rebooting the Transformer Cinematic Universe, a Dr. Seuss biopic, Netflix's live action Full Metal Alchemist trailer is hit. We'll give you a reaction. Uh, Lost in Cloverfield cinematographer is directing the killer Teddy bear movie we'll talk about that in the first isle of dogs reviews uh have hit the web and we'll tell you uh what people are saying about wes anderson's new movie and we will also be before we get into the news we'll be diving into the mailbag to talk about the uh incorrect dialects and accents uh so that is the plan for today's show this is slash film editor-in-chief peter sreda and joining me on today's podcast is slash film senior writer ben pearson Hey, what's going on? And writers, Hwai Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. It's Friday, everyone. Uh, ben is back. You went on a big trip to Mexico. Uh, before we get into everything, why don't you tell us about it? Sure, yeah. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, Disney flew me and probably maybe like 20 other journalists out to Oaxaca, Mexico to visit a lot of the locations that the Pixar animation team and the, the directors and all that, um, they went out and, and got inspiration for Coco, which is coming to home video uh, pretty soon. I think it's right now actually available on digital HD already, but it's coming out on Blu-ray at the end of the month. Um, so we went to these ancient ruins in this place called Monte Alban, which served as the inspiration for uh, some of the Day of the Dead or the Land of the Dead stuff, which was there. Um, and we got to make our own alabrijes, which were uh, these uh, creatures from Mexican folk art, folklore that are painted, you know, bright colors and all this stuff. And they they play a pretty significant role in the movie. If you've seen Coco, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and we got to like don't, tour don't, don't, a, don't they actually put those by your bedside to like guard you while you sleep or something uh i don't know if they put them there but but part of it is like a guardian the, yeah. there's like a, a spirit animal guardian uh aspect to the whole thing um and then part of it is also based on like when you're born based on like the the zapotec calendar and stuff there's i mean there's so much like information that we learned on this thing i can't possibly uh sum it up in, <laughs> in like two minutes but yeah, yeah. Uh, i'll have a bunch of articles and um I got to speak with Adrian Molina, who was the co-director of the movie and a writer on the film. He wrote some of the music of the movie. Um, and I've got a, a ton of video and everything. So I'm going to try to edit together uh, at least one video. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure maybe I'll be back on the podcast in the future to talk about those things more specifically. But uh, in general, the trip was really great. It was my first time in Mexico. And um, just being able to sort of walk in the filmmakers' shoes and see what they saw um, really you know, hammered home the whole thing about Coco, which is authenticity. Like this, this movie, uh, I loved the film already, like before I even went to Mexico and just seeing like the real families and the traditions and everything that they were able to sort of seamlessly incorporate into the film um, just makes me love it even more. Yeah, that, that that's one of the things I love about a film like Coco or Moana is that it really envelops you into that world and culture and it really makes you want to you know uh learn more about the the things that are just touched upon in those mm -hmm. movies um but yes let, let's get into the mailbag yesterday uh ben you weren't here but we talked about um dialects and in movies and inaccurate uh um uh accents uh you know some some people were uh someone wrote in and basically said that they had a problem with uh something in the orient express and um you know we, we we had a discussion on that uh i asked readers if if they had any examples uh to write in and we had a couple of people write in i'll put the whole emails in the sh show notes uh but basically uh uh one of our readers dp writes in the problem with a bad accent in movies is that it pulls you out and makes you realize that how the makers are lazy. Whereas when done right, it brings the authenticity to the work and a lot of respect to the filmmakers. Uh, the best example of this being done right, he actually, for some reason, uses the example of Iron Man. Uh, he he basically says that, you know, when you see the terrorist uh, in the Ten Rings video uh, declaring the kidnapping of T Tony Stark, uh, that that appears to be, 
that 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 is authentic to what what that would be and also uh when you end up seeing uh Stark's fellow captive uh there he he's speaking a dialect that would be someone that's not fully proficient and still learning in that in that language which is uh is interesting that uh, a film like Iron Man would get you know those touches right and he, he gives uh, some examples of uh, some bad stuff another person uh Anders, I think, uh, from Norway, writes in uh, that Hollywood has portrayed the Scandinavian and uh, especially Norwegian accent terribly wrong for many decades. And by that, he talks about, um, you know, the accent. And uh, he um, he says the Hollywood version is way over the top and everybody sounds like nutcases. Uh, the wrong accent. Uh, Norwegians visiting in a Simpsons episode. He, he gives a bunch of examples. I'll leave the full email in, in the in, in the show notes. But, uh, I mean, I, I think this does go to show you that uh, coming from Americans, <laughs> we, we don't notice it as much because, we you know, we don't know what uh, the rest of the world should sound like. And uh, it's something that just seems like authentic to us probably – uh, I mean, this is so ignorant to say, but like it, it doesn't register as wrong. But if you're from that area, obviously it does register as wrong. It's just like when I was talking about, you know, Boston accents in movies. You know, I'm from Boston, so I can tell a bad Boston accent, whereas someone not from Boston probably can't. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, actually, Ben, you, you weren't on the discussion. Do you have any examples of a, an accent or dialect in a movie taking you out because it didn't feel authentic? Oh, geez. Putting me on the spot. Um, (laughs) I would say that, uh, well, I'm from Florida. So a lot of uh, Southern accents in movies are like way over the top and really, really, I mean, I I, I almost can't watch um, the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift because Lucas Black's Southern accent is so terrible and distracting. Um, So yeah, I think that one is the one that that really is like a a deal breaker for me. Um, And yeah, I think in general, those are the ones, and I guess it's just like what you're talking about, Peter, because I'm from the South, quote unquote, uh, I sort of know what that is supposed to sound like. And I guess that's like the the point of this entire conversation. It's like the specificity of people who are from those regions, obviously, uh, you know, it's a big red flag when somebody tries to roll in and, and pull it off and they don't quite succeed. And, and uh, you know, I talked about this yesterday, but uh, I, I think what you're saying goes to my greater point that like, you know, yes, there's regional accents but not everybody in florida sounds the same not everybody in the south sounds the same you know like there there there's people that that uh you know there's a wide range not everybody from boston sounds like you know the people from the ben affleck movies Mm -hmm. so uh, but uh uh one last uh feedback email uh eddie from philadelphia writes in because we were talking about den of thieves 2 and we kind of were uh dismissive of den of thieves 1 and he 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 ended up seeing the movie with his movie pass and he says he found it to be a pretty enjoyable action slash heist movie uh the ending of the film set up a sequel quite nicely so it doesn't surprise me that they're greenlighting a sequel considering you saw geostorm oh my god calling me out uh i think that it's worth you Using your movie pass to go see this film although it's a long film it's a great theater experience so yeah maybe i'll have to check out den of thieves if that's still in movie theaters i mean i guess it probably is in la somewhere um i'll have to see if i can see it on my movie pass but let's uh jump into the news and let's start off with uh the cloverfield paradox which did a surprise premiere uh after the super bowl um we've been talking on the podcast speculating on if that uh if that move was a good move for Netflix, I mean, it seemed like it was a good move, but uh, how many subscribers and how many viewers do you think they got out of that uh, promotion? Uh, HT, we now have some sort of idea. You wrote, wrote about it for the site. What do we know? Yeah, so The Cloverfield Paradox uh, premiered on Netflix surprisingly uh, on February 4th, Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday. Um, and according to Nielsen estimates, it garnered – 5 million viewers in a seven-day period after its surprise premiere. And um, it pulled in 2.8 million in its first three days. So uh, in this 5 million for the seven-day period, that would be roughly the equivalent to maybe 45 million at the box office, provided all audience members bought tickets, which would – it's like – it's a pretty middling uh, amount of money and um, would – about break even for the movie's uh, 40 million plus 
production budget. So um, this is does not nearly do the numbers that the Netflix's biggest success, Bright, garnered, which um, which the film got 11 million U.S. viewers in its first three days of release. So that's not even half. Of, oh, it's about half of it, but in a longer period of time. So, um, but, but Netflix we spent a lot more money on that film, right? Yes, they did. They spent about ninety million dollars, I believe, and um, so it's it about breaks even for Netflix. It's not something that is hugely uh, successful, but it's something that's about middling or to okay to moderate, and um, we we don't. This doesn't quite uh, put support to the sort of statements that we're saying about how this would be a game changing. Uh, format of release for this for these kind of big budget sci-fi films yeah i I wonder if it's the fact that you know this was it was so so promoted as kind of like a sequel to the original cloverfield in those initial super bowl advertisements i'm wondering if that kind of hurt it because you know uh, as much as we think of Cloverfield as this, you know, huge success, it really wasn't that huge of a success. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, that turned people off rather than marketing it as its own movie that, like, surprise premiered. Uh, but th- the other thing I'm wondering is, you know, Netflix has been so secretive and doesn't want to release their own numbers. These Nielsen numbers we've talked about in the past are estimates uh, based on, you know, uh, a sampling of Netflix subscribers. So I'm wondering... I'm wondering how accurate this, these numbers are, number one. And I'm wondering, number two, how long is it going to take before, you know, with Nielsen keep on reporting these these estimates, how long is it going to take before Netflix comes out and is like, no, those numbers are complete bullshit? Honestly, <laughs> we, we won't know which one is true because we have no way of verifying if Netflix's yeah. numbers themselves are quite accurate either. So for now, this is the closest we have to actual ratings. But again, like you said, we have no idea whether this will jibe with Netflix's ultimate numbers or whether either of them are accurate. It's just all kind of a guessing yeah. game for us. So it's it's I, interesting. I, we don't really know whether this is a success or not. Yeah, and I can tell you this, in, in, in the web world, there's a, a bunch of people that estimate how many people come to websites. Like there's a Comscore, there's Alexa, there's Compete, there's a bunch of those kind of companies that, uh, you know, install stuff on uh, sampling of people's browsers and estimate how many viewers they have. And I can tell you, uh, you know, from someone who, who owns and runs a big uh, movie website, that none of them are close to being accurate they're they're all far far off from the numbers so um so i'd assume that it's probably not accurate but i'm wondering what in what direction is it not accurate um but yeah let's move on uh we were talking about uh you know cloverfield paradox came from paramount it was uh uh basically sold to netflix paramount is kind of in uh you know, in, in an interesting area where they're they're uh, at a at a crossroads. I, I think it's probably <laughs> the word to say. Uh, you know, they're rebooting the Transformers uh, franchise with Bumblebee, but uh, some people are wondering: Is this going to be a whole reboot for the Transformers cinematic universe? That is uh, the topic of a new rumor that came out today. Ben, you wrote about it. What do we know? Yeah, so Bumblebee is a prequel that's set, I think, in the 1980s before the events that we saw in the the current Transformers franchise timeline. But uh, today, uh, Transformers World reports that at a Hasbro Toy Fair preview event, uh, the company, quote, specifically stated that a new team at Paramount will reset the Transformers live action movie series after Bumblebee the movie comes out later uh, this year in December. So... Right now, Transformers 6, which was the untitled sequel to last year's Transformers The Last Night, has been taken off of Paramount's release calendar. And we have no idea when another Transformers movie is going to be arriving. But that is sort of a big deal that they're planning to bring in a new team to reset this whole thing because they made such a big deal about uh, hiring Akiva Goldsman to oversee this big writer's room at Paramount with a bunch of writers coming in to write a ton of different Transformers sequels and spinoffs. This was only like a couple years ago. And because I think because uh, Transformers The Last Night underperformed so much at the box office, Paramount is trying to right the ship. And it looks like they're they're making some pretty sweeping changes 
um, and it looks like a full reboot is is in order here. So um, it's not surprising based on I, I think Transformers: The Last Night is the most expensive Transformers movie yet, but it made like I think only like six hundred and ten million dollars worldwide or something. And these movies are so big that they pretty much have to make a billion for them to be considered a success. And it like barely cleared half a billion so um it's it's not really surprising that paramount is like all right we gotta do something to switch things up here yeah I, it, it, it makes sense too because this is you know this movie set in like the 1980s it's a smaller film uh it's it seems like it's going to be setting up things that uh were kind of already told in the other movies so like it, i don't know if there's a point of doing you know to sticking to that uh "Quote unquote canon." I'm not sure if there really is a Transformers canon, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I'm interested to hear what you guys think, uh, uh, Chris and HD. Uh, do you? I, I know we've been, you know, uh, in Michael Bay's Transformers world uh, for quite some time now, and I know Transformers has gotten a, a lot of, I guess, some bad buzz from you know the film geek community because of that but do you think there there is a potential now that they're rebooting the they could be rebooting this franchise that you know transformers could be a property to watch in the future (laughs) (laughs) Uh, go Um, ahead ht you go especially now that michael bay is not involved i should you know yeah i wonder if they're trying to sort of revamp this series to be more family and kid friendly because under Michael Bay, they've become films that are perfect for a 14 year old boy and not really anyone else. Um, So I wonder if they're, if like with uh, Haley Steinfeld's character in the Mumblebee movie, they're trying to reach a, a larger demographic and make it just wider reaching in general and less sort of gritty and explosive. Like we've seen for the last Transformers movies, although I haven't actually watched all of them, so I can't quite say. But, yeah, I mean, it sounds very similar to what the X-Men universe was doing with their soft reboot with X-Men First Class. Although that ended up kind of weaving together both sort of alternate, like the the reboot version and also the, the old version of, this, of the uh, franchise. So I feel like it'll be somewhat similar if they can maybe do it a little bit cleaner than with x-men maybe it'll work out chris your thoughts well i had an interesting thought it was um what if they never made a transformers movie again <laughs> <laughs> but why chris why, why why would you want to want that uh i don't know i just think it'd be a cool thing it'd be really co- that would be the coolest thing for paramount to do so if you're listening paramount Kids really like it when you don't make movies, so don't make any more fran- uh, Transformers films. You'll be the coolest <laughs> franchise ever. You know, we should talk about Paramount for a second here because, you know, they had this kind of uh, not so, uh, you know, it was kind of a failure with Mother. Uh, Annihilation is, uh, you know, they've given out the international uh, distribution rights to Netflix. They dumped uh, Cloverfield Paradox on Netflix, uh, you know, they spent like fifty million dollars on it. They got fifty million dollars, uh, fifty million dollars on it, so they broke even. But uh, and now, you know, there's word that they're uh, maybe actually rebooting the whole Transformers cinematic universe. Um, what do you think this means for the the future of Paramount? Man, that's a good question. I mean, they they are constantly on the lookout for more big franchise stuff. I mean, they have Bad Robot, kind of, even though J.J. Abrams is pretty busy with Star Wars right now. They have uh, the Mission Impossible movies, and MI6 looks, I think it's the sixth one, right? (laughs) The one that's coming out this year. Um, Fallout, Mission Impossible Fallout, that looks really great, I think. So, uh, you know, they're they're not exactly, like, hanging on by a thread, but I I don't think anyone would rank Paramount among, like, the top two or three studios out there right now so um yeah for them to i as much as i sort of actually agree with chris that i'd love to never see another transformers movie i don't think the studio can afford to just abandon uh you know a franchise with such recognizable um ip so i think uh we're probably in for many many more transformers movies over the years but um yeah, I, I don't know what do you think peter do you you think there's well when you're on the on the paramount backlot uh 
did you didn't you used to work on the paramount back lot i did yeah for about two years i worked at paramount i was giving tours of the lot and uh yeah it was like one of the coolest jobs i've ever had it, uh, at the time did they have michael bay way they have a whole uh, street yes. dedicated yeah. to mm-hmm. michael bay they had a whole street for him oh my yeah. god yeah and they have yeah they have like uh leonard nimoy um they have one dedicated to him as well uh yeah a bunch of big people throughout the you know, adolf zuko or the the founder of paramount yeah i remember i was talking to you um Michael Bay at a press thing. It was like a you know a party kind of off, uh, not off record, but you know like not like an interview. And he was telling the story of him pitching. Um, what was that movie he recently made? That was a war movie. Um, oh, uh, the one with thirteen Bagman or, uh, or something. no? It was the the, the Benghazi movie. Benghazi, yes, the Benghazi, Benghazi yes. Secret Soldiers of Benghazi or something. Oh, like yeah. the, the twelve, the horse soldiers movie. No, not that one. No, no. <laughs> No, that's <laughs> another Secret Soldiers movie. Yeah, 13, one. 13 hours, I think. Yeah, 13, 13 okay. hours. I remember he was telling me the story of how he was pitching that to the executive of Paramount, and they were like, I don't know. This doesn't, you know, whatever. It doesn't sound like a good idea. And uh, he, like, went over to the window pulled up the shades pointed to the sign <laughs> of that that his you know the street outside was you know with his name on it and he, he's like you, you you need you know you owe this to me <laughs> wow oh <my> <laughs> yeah and i might be misquoting him but it, it was basically that uh it was funny <laughs> but uh yeah yeah i i think paramount needs the transformers movies sadly enough um it'd be interesting uh you know we've been hearing about these these acquisitions i i know C- CBS just is, is what, what they're acquiring Viacom, which owns Paramount, right? Am I? I think that's a right. There's a merger. I, I don't know. It, it's kind of confusing to me. Uh, but it would be interesting. Like, why doesn't like a company like Netflix, uh, who has all this money in the world, uh, buy Paramount? Paramount's uh, only worth five, ten billion dollars. Sadly, you know. <laughs> um, uh, you I still know, don't know where Netflix gets all their money. <laughs> I don't understand how they can make all these huge billion dollar deals well, and how, still how, how many people on this podcast are paying netflix monthly all I right am. all right <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how netflix is getting all their money but we, we should probably move on um let's move on to the dr seuss biopic coming from the director of wonder uh chris you wrote this up for the site what do we know Yes, uh, Stephen Chbosky, is that how you say his name? If it's I not, so. let's pretend it is. Um, he directed The Perks of Being a Wallflower. He also wrote the book Perks of Being a Wallflower, and he directed Wonder. Uh, he's now going to make a Dr. Seuss biopic, which is centered around uh, Dr. Seuss's early days before he became Dr. Seuss, where he was basically struggling to find his wife and uh, he uh, trying struggling to find his voice, and then he met his wife. And she inspired him to become a writer. Uh, so it's it's one of those, I don't know, it just sounds like a generic sort of biopic that won't be very uh, in-depth, but we'll see. Yeah, it sounds like one of those kind of origin, like, is it kind of like, um, what was that one? They just did one with Christopher Robin. They did one with um, Charles Dickens. Do you think it's something like right. that? That's what it sounds like. It's like, this is how he became Dr. Seuss, you know, that sort of thing, which... Fine, whatever. We'll yeah. see. You'll, you'll get to see his exciting upbringing in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, where I lived, uh, uh, you know, eight years of my life, and it, it's not an exciting place at all. So um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> is, is, is anybody here excited to see a Dr. Seuss biopic? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like Dr. Seuss's works, but I'm not very interested in the man himself, especially if the story is as dull as it sounds. And I, I think that we'll get a, a nice thankless role for a, a, the long struggling wife who will maybe get an Oscar nomination. I don't know. <laughs> right. But also, I guess it depends on, cause this is young Dr. Seuss. So are they going to like make him like young, hot Dr. Seuss? That might okay, draw that away, I'd be like, interested be, in. Like it's, it's young, Do- like he's, he's always got his shirt off and he's got really great abs all the time. People <laughs> might see that. It's Dr. Seuss <laughs> begins. Yeah. Um, but let's move on. Uh, we were talking about Netflix, Netflix, uh, it released a live action Full Metal Alchemist trailer. Uh, I don't really know much about Full Metal Alchemist, so I'm going to have to go to our uh, anime expert, HT. What, what is Full Metal Alchemist about? 
Um, <laughs> Full Metal Alchemist is one of my favorite animes. I must say that. Actually, it's my favorite anime of all time. So it really pained me to watch and write about this live action trailer for what I think is one of the best animes of all time. So it is set in early 20th century Amistris, which is a European-inspired fictional country, uh, sort of industrial age, very steampunk-inspired type of setting. And it follows two brothers who are um, alchemists and have their lives wracked by tragedy, partially by their own hands. They attempt to bring back their mother from the dead and in the process uh, lose Edward's arm and Alphonse's entire body. So it's a really, really wonderful um action-packed and sort of meditative almost uh, series that is just, uh, it was first a manga and then it became two anime adaptations. And the first anime adaptation is, is so phenomenal. And this live action movie does not look like it will do any sort of justice to what the series is. So it uh, it, it, it looks <laughs> horrible. It looks like um. I'm I'm honestly astonished that we were talking about it here because I don't think it's worth <laughs> talking about. It looks so bad. I don't know. I I thought a lot of people would be interested in Full Metal Alchemist, but like it looks worse than uh, uh the, the last Airbender movie. Like okay, it, that it, was it, that was one that I wanted to erase from my mind too. I know this looks like it's uh cosplayers running around in a fan film. Um, That's what. That was my impression, too. They have bad wigs, bad costumes. And the thing is, there's a lot of um, controversy over whitewashing over anime adaptations. But I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here and say that Full Metal Alchemist would actually benefit greatly from being cast with Western actors and being set in Europe because that's what the story is. It's set in like a very European inspired industrial age style series with European characters like they have blonde hair and they have Western names and there's even allusions to being sort of an alternate version of Germany in the original series so it's very odd to me that like of all things they chose to make this one as Japanese as possible and it makes no sense yeah and when uh when anyone in a trailer like, I'm gonna make a new rule here if, if there's a trailer and someone in the trailer yells out uh whatever the MacGuffin of the movie is you know is a myth it's probably a bad movie <laughs> uh ben what are what are your thoughts on this trailer yeah i mean i i was baffled that this is a thing that netflix is comfortable attaching its name to this really does i mean i've seen so but, but, many but, but you bring up a good question ben when netflix has a bad movie like you know paramounted with cloverfield Par paradox there's no netflix for them to offload that bad movie to <laughs> Yeah, that's true. They just have to live with their their consequences. Um, guys, guys, like I have seen uh, multiple fan films that have better production value and and like CG, you know, <laughs> graphics and quality and all this stuff that are better than what is on display here. This is like everyone associated with this should be embarrassed. Um, the only thing that I can say about this is like my wife and I just started rewatching Game of Thrones from the very beginning. Um, we're planning a trip and we, we may end up going to some of the locations that that, um, that were used in Game of Thrones. So we wanted to sort of refresh ourselves and lead into the, the final season and uh, rewatching the pilot. It's sort of amazing how much from the books makes it in there and, and just the idea of. Uh, a property that was so beloved in one form, getting an adaptation that um, the getting a live action adaptation period. I, I have to imagine that when people who were reading game of Thrones in the nineties saw what happened in when HBO created that pilot in 2011, that they must've just, their minds must've been blown. So maybe there are some people out here who can look past the uh, sort of ridiculous aspects that are so glaring to us in this full metal alchemist trailer and just get excited about the idea that a version of it exists in live action, but that is like the most generous thing I can say about this. Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, I think it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it does uh, not look good. <laughs> I just want to say, please don't judge Full Metal Alchemist by this trailer, and I highly recommend the original anime series. It is so excellent and surprisingly poignant. So just, just ignore that this exists, and I 
I don't know why Hollywood and the movie industry in general, this isn't Hollywood, but just the whole movie industry is intent on wrecking my favorite things for this and <laughs> Avatar The Last Airbender. Please stop. Yeah, I'm sorry to bring bring up bad memories, HD. But um, <laughs> l- l- let's move on to some some good things. Uh, a cinematographer from Lost in Cloverfield. No, we're not talking about Larry Fong. Uh, is going to direct the Killer Teddy Bear movie. HD wrote this up for the site. What do we know? Yeah, so there is a viral horror short called. Teddy Bears Are for Lovers that was released back in 2016 and offered a really promising premise about vengeful teddy bears from ex-lovers who uh, come to life and attempt to kill the sort of playboy owner of the, these teddy bears. So it's it was a short short um, that was only about 10 minutes long, but now it's being made into a feature-length film, uh, sort of in the vein of Gremlins, which... Uh, heavily inspired the original short film as well and uh the this will be michael bonvillain i hope that's how you say his name <laughs> um it almost sounded like you said bond villain it does sound like i said bond villain <laughs> bond villain but it's bon, it's b-o-n-v-i-l-l-a-i-n so that's okay. as close as i'll say it the lost and cloverfield cinematographer uh and he will be teaming up with uh peter jackson's Weed a workshop uh, to make this feature film, and um, as well as the the uh, director of Gremlins, Joe Dante, who will be executive producing this series, this uh, film. I'm sorry. Sounds like a dream so, team. Yeah, sounds like a fun film, and uh, it's a very it's a very fun short film. I recommend taking a peek at it before. Um, the film comes out i'm sure it'll take a couple of years yeah we, we posted the short film when it originally hit the web uh what a couple of years back or something um we we'll link to it in the show notes so you can watch the original short film uh which is still online so yeah uh but let's move on to our last story for today and that is wes anderson's new movie has premiered at the berlin film festival chris you did a roundup of the reviews is it good Yes, uh, I am very jealous of everyone who got to see this at Berlin um, because, I mean, I already I already wanted to see it, but there is not a single, of the roundup I did, there's not a single bad review. Everyone is saying it's great. They're, you know, th- they're throwing around words like delightful and, you know, magical, things like that. Um, the, the biggest complaint I could find was someone saying, you know, it's if you've seen a Wes Anderson movie, it's a familiar sort of film because all Wes Anderson movies have that same sort of style to them. But other than that, this is a, a cinematic delight is what people are saying. And now I really want to see this even more than I already did to begin with. Hmm. Well, you can read the whole roundup of reviews on SlashFilm.com as you can with all the stories we talked about today. Chris, where can people find more of your work online? Uh, I'm at SlashFilm.com, and you can find me on Twitter at CEvangelista413. Ben, where can people find you? Uh, I'm at SlashFilm as well, and you can find me on Twitter at Ben Pears. You, uh, HT, where can people find you? I'm also at SlashFilm, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBui. You can find me at SlashFilm on Twitter. Uh, you can find this podcast, Slash Film Daily, published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, if you have an email, if you want to send us an email, you can do so at peter at slash film dot com. Uh, please leave your name and general geographical location in case, in case we mention it on the air. Please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Spread the word. Tell your friends. And we will see you on Monday.